um, to get added to the mailing list. Do keep an eye out for our next event, the July Tech Tea or Tech Fizz rather, uh, which will be an informal networking event that's a great way to keep in touch with the local professional community in Sheffield and South Yorkshire. Now, we are delighted to be presenting two fantastic speakers this evening. Melissa Simmons, who is Adult Autism Coordinator for Voluntary Action Sheffield, VAS, and the Sheffield Autism Partnership Network, SP, S, SAPN, which was launched in July 2021. And our second speaker is Alice Sandy Renard, a learning mentor and a Sheffield woman in technology. So I'm going to stop sharing the main screen now and pass over to Melissa to present. Thank you. Hi, can everybody hear and see me? Well, I don't know if people can see me, but presumably, well, I'm hoping people can see me. Um, so I'm going to do the first part of um, this presentation, and I hope you find it informative. I'm happy to um, answer questions. Um, so yeah, I guess I, I will begin. This is where I forget how to share. I think it's ironic that this is about women in technology because I, I lack the ability to do anything technical um, and the people who I work with can and will attest to this. Well, that looks perfect to me, Melissa, so that's fine. Thank you. Okay, you, so um, the presentation is for, for you all, for the Sheffield Women in Technology uh, Network, I believe you're called. And so we're going to be looking at neurodiversity and in particular, a spotlight on autism. back. So I always start my presentations with this, uh, with this YouTube, because I think it's excellent. And I often, even though there is like a misconception that people who are autistic are like incredibly bright and can figure everything out and everything makes sense. Very little makes sense to me on any given day. So I think in pictures, and so for me, and a person who thinks in pictures, this makes a lot of sense to me. Melissa, are we able to just check the sound on that video, please? Sorry, what did you say? Are we able to just check the sound on the video? Some of the attendees are reporting that they can't hear the video. They can see the video, but they can't hear it. Right, how do I do that? Um, so uh, can you just, just check on your audio on your computer? Is that okay. possible? Right, I'll stop sharing for a second. Apologies, everyone. Please bear with us. Thank you. Yeah, like I said, I'm I'm not good with technology. Okay, so what do I need to do? Right, okay, let me just check. Mm, when you're sharing, yeah. Can you just check the Zoom? Can you just check the Zoom settings um, to share that you're sharing sound? To check that you're also sharing sound as well as visual. So if you okay, let me have a look. 
might be the cause of the problem. Oh, so share found. I think I've found it. All right, we'll try again. And if it doesn't work, let me know. Thank Tell you. Me. Tell me if you can hear this. Fantastic. Yes. Wonderful. We are all different. And that's wonderful. Some differences are easy to see. Height, hairstyle, eye color, and so on. Other differences can't be seen. Our favorite foods, fears, or special skills. Interestingly, the way we see the world is also different. For instance, what do you see in this drawing? Most people see a duck. But some of you might have seen a rabbit. Whichever you saw, you are correct. This is just a trick drawing to show you that all brains work differently. The brain is your body's computer. It works differently for all of us and controls how you learn. That's why we are all good at different things. How you feel, which is why we all feel different emotions. And how you communicate. <laughs> Sometimes the brain is connected in such a way it affects senses and how we perceive and read situations and interactions. This is known as autism. Many people have autism, so it's likely you already know someone who is autistic. And for this reason, it's useful to know a little bit about autism. The special wiring inside an autistic brain can sometimes make the person good at tasks we may find difficult, such as mathematics, drawing, or music. It can also do the opposite, and activities we find too easy are incredibly difficult to them, such as making friends. The senses constantly send information to your brain about your surroundings and other people. However, when a person's brain and its senses don't communicate well, the brain can become overwhelmed and confused, affecting how they see the world. Picture yourself walking down the street. This is how an autistic brain may experience the same walk. Scary, isn't it? Sadly, in many cases, the person can't say out loud how they feel. So even though there's chaos going on in their heads, they seem okay on the outside, unable to ask for help. We will develop behaviors to help us feel calm in uncomfortable situations. We may look away, hug ourselves, chew our fingernails, fidget, bite our lips, and so on. Equally, autistic people develop behaviors that help them cope with these intense moments. These actions may seem unusual, but they're just their way to feel calm. When they happen, it means they are having a hard time. The kind thing to do is not to give them an even harder time by getting cross, ignoring them, or mocking them. Remember, just because a PlayStation can't read an Xbox game, it doesn't mean it's broken. People with autism need friends who are willing to take the time to know them. With good communication and plenty of patience, everyone would be better off. People with autism are not ill or broken. They simply have a unique view of the world. And with a little support from their friends, they might just be able to share that view with us. Autism can make Amazing things happen. Um, 
Um, so I always, I, at this time of, in my presentation, I, I always ask people what they think about um, what they've just seen. So I, I don't know how we want to how we want to do it this time around if people want to write any comments in the the comment box or if somebody wants to kind of raise their hand or or just kind of give me some feedback on what they think about that animation we could take some comments in the chat box if everybody's happy to share their views I don't mind speaking and um, start everybody off if that's any help. Thank you. Oh. I've just introduced, sorry, I was late, kids. Um, I, I'll just introduce myself. Um, my name's Rebecca. I live um, on the out, well, I live between Barnsley and Chess, uh, Sheffield. So um, I know the area well. I have a son of seven with autism. Um, we, sorry, I can hear my toddler in the background having toddler tantrums with his dad. Um, and I've been through the ringer with the local authority as a lot of, well, nearly every autism um, send parent has been send parent carer. And I think it's fantastic that you can put on a presentation like this. I mean, I only came on on the tail end of it because it discusses terms such as high functioning, low functioning, Asperger's. They are harmful, harmful terms because for me, it, um, the term low functioning is horrible um, to be honest it makes you know you, you feel that a child has got nothing or an adult with low functioning autism has nothing to give and that um, they have issues in every area which is untrue and high functioning the term for me makes you feel that oh they're high functioning so they're just like the neurotypical peers so they don't have any needs when in fact you can have a child what you can think of as low functioning having less needs than a child which is high functioning and has fantastic communication I've come across that a lot and Asperger's well don't even get me going there you know everybody thinks of um what's his face in Big Bang don't there as Asperger's and again people you know with that, what were labeled as Asperger's were seen as like these uh, fantastic savants and Einstein's and they're not, they're not at all, they have needs as well. And it's these labels which stop people accessing support. Um, and schools are geared up for these labels, aren't they? You know, these big SEND schools, they're normally geared up for the severe classic autism. When all children with additional needs and autism need help and support, not just the ones where you can see and hear that they need support. Anyway, I'll shut up, <laughs> but I just thought I'd put my bit in to start with. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've, we've had some comments in the chat. If you're happy for me to share those as well, Melissa. Yeah. Um, some of the attendees have said, I think it's very accurate for me about how I see, feel, experience the world. I am an autistic woman diagnosed later on in life. Um, refreshing, a really good way to think about autism. Uh, someone else thought it was great. My son has autism and it is really helpful. And another attendee has said, I can second what one of the attendees has said. They are also a late diagnosed autistic ADHD person. The one thing that they missed was that they uh, also, pe many people happy stim, and not only when just when people are upset, uncomfortable, or feeling overwhelmed. Um, some other comments are I think it's brilliant, makes perfect sense. And um, another attendee has come forward to say that as an autistic adult, can Melissa just mention identity first language and the importance of that? And um, um, I think that's what we've, what we've got in the chat at the moment. If anybody else is happy to come off mute, mute on this occasion to share their views verbally, um, Melissa, are you, still are you still happy for people to do that? Yeah, but I think what I'll, what I'll do first, I'll just address some of the things that have been said, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so within the autism movement, um, we do talk about identity first, uh, so like person first, um, disability first type language. And when, like when I first started to understand autism, we use terms like has, like, oh, I have autism, as if it's something that isn't a part of me. 
Um, the more I've understood and learned about autism, we realize that actually the majority of autistic people prefer to say like, I am autistic. And the way I describe it is, I can have a flu or I can have a handbag or I can have a pen in my hand and put it down, but I can't change the color of my skin. So I am black. I don't have blackness. I am a black woman. And so equally I am autistic. And so there's a lot of um, disagreement sometimes about how you should I address an autistic person. And what we've, what we try to do is say, you know, a person has every right to identify themselves however they choose to. But whenever I'm talking about autism or autistic people, I will address it like that. So I will say they are autistic people um, or that is an autistic person. So that is that is important for me to to explain to people. And I also understand that not it, it depends on the circles you're in and the people you're amongst to whether you know about that and why it's so important for a lot of autistic adults to be addressed correctly. But this is what we're trying to push and it's what I try to push in everything I do going forward. So even though I absolutely love the animation, some of the language in there doesn't sit comfortably for me. And I know that the animator is now aware of it. So going forward, I believe he's changed how he speaks about autism um, as as it was mentioned as well as some people have mentioned like autism as it says on this uh this this sheet autism is a lifelong disability and in order to get a diagnosis of autism you have to show difficulties in communication and you also have to show difficulties in other areas so, um, so it's social communication and social interaction challenges and repetitive restrictive disorder uh, uh, behaviors. Now, when people talk about the autism spectrum, people do think about like a, 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 almost like a, um, a line. And so when my son was diagnosed, um, gosh, 14, 13 years ago, he was diagnosed. I was told that my son had mild autism. So as a parent, I felt quite relieved by that because I thought, oh, thank goodness, at least it's only mild. And so when I was diagnosed uh, five years ago, I would have been diagnosed as somebody who has Asperger's. And my son was diagnosed as somebody with mild autism because his language, um, it took longer for his language to come in. I've since realized and understand now that that's wrong. And so the spectrum isn't a line, it's not linear. It's actually a spectrum, if you think about a spectrum of color. And so one person may have lots of social um, difficulties and they may struggle a lot with repetition, whereas somebody else may not struggle as much with repetition. But we, as autistic people, we all have areas in, we all have difficulties in those areas, but our difficulties vary depending on who we are. So for instance, for somebody like me who function, who appears to function very well, I will never be entitled to something like PIP, although I struggle with a lot of things. And a part of that is, so people who were diagnosed as being, having Asperger's, there's a there's a prejudice to it and a misconception then that they're incredibly smart and they can cope with life and that might not be the case. So one of the reasons why now people get a diagnosis of autism instead of mild, high, low, severe, we they now use the term autism. It's to try and get rid of the prejudice. So a person who may not be verbal can be incredibly bright but the minute that you know that they have severe autism, you don't even address them. You talk to their carer or their parent. And so we want to kind of, we're, we're trying to redress that balance and make the diagnosis of autism more equitable. So that's why we now, well, this is why I show this picture to explain to people it's not a line. And actually it's quite, it's quite painful and offensive when I hear terms like, high functioning and low functioning and 
Um, unfortunately, still a lot of parents use it, especially parents of older children and adult children, because that was the diagnosis their child received. Mm. But now we're moving away from that and we, use, we solely use the term autism. Um, I'll go on to the next slide. Right. So there is a because we're talking about uh, women in technology, it's important for me to talk about the gender bias in diagnosing autistic people. And so you have to excuse me because I'm not I don't have information when it comes to trans autistic people. So the information that I have is around um, cis men and cis women and I'm so I'm not sure what the figures are for for trans people um but as a cis woman you you're often misdiagnosed with something else or you don't receive a diagnosis until much later on so when my child was diagnosed at six I, as a mother to my daughter, I was devastated and I felt like I'd failed my child and that she'd struggle for six years. As she started to get older and I started to be amongst other women um, and, and autistic cis girls, I started to realise that actually six was still quite young. And so for, for, for women and for, for, for girls, there is a lot of misdiagnosis or so people sometimes get di well no I'm not going to say what people sometimes diagnose with because actually I can't give you the figures to that so but what I can say categorically and what I am certain of is women tend to have late diagnosis or not be diagnosed at all so I can very very adamantly say that um I can also talk about about that um I can also talk to you about camouflaging and masking and that is something that happens in both it, it happens in all the genders um but it's found more in in women and girls and masking is basically faking it that's what masking and camouflaging is and so I always used to describe my daughter as a solar panel so in school she coped really well she she was a she was a bit of a chatterbox but we could cope with that but she she did well in school you know she was kind to the children and she she worked well and and she listened to what the teachers said but getting from the school door to the playground she was a different child and I'd explain it like a solar panel or like when you think about somebody who smokes, think about a chain smoker who works in an office. And like I said before, I think in pictures, so I explain a lot in pictures. So if you think about a chain smoker who works in an office, actually they have got to sit in that office and do their work. But the minute they finish work, they will light up a cigarette and they will have one cigarette after another. And that's kind of like what my daughter was like, where she held it together in school and then when she came out she would have a lot of stomach ache she would have a lot of headache and it's because actually she wasn't struggling at all she wasn't coping at all but she wasn't she didn't feel safe enough around those people to show that and so that's what camouflaging is that's how I describe camouflaging and while masking and camouflaging some people think oh it's a beneficial thing to fit in it's really mentally exhausting incredibly exhausting because for the entire day you're acting like you can cope and so you're putting on a show and I think one of the sad things about masking and camouflaging is you're often not even aware that you're doing it because you do it so well or you've been doing it for so long and so when a person is used to camouflaging they often don't have a sense of self or their own identity because they are so used to assessing the world around them and acting accordingly to fit in. So they've got no concept of self. They don't really know what they do and don't like because they just 
go along with everybody else to not draw attention to themselves and so that is really common in 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 autistic women um, and camouflaging can also affect access to diagnosis so someone like myself who's autistic I didn't realize until later on in life and had I not been amongst other families who had autistic girls and daughters I wouldn't have realized how prevalent it was in in girls and I also wouldn't have realized and seen it in myself so um and then even to pursue a diagnosis if you if your GP doesn't understand it in girls as much or women it's really difficult because they're your first port of call so being able to cope appears to be a really good thing but actually it has a really big knock-on effect to the rest of your life God, so i'm trying to press it along and it won't allow me to okay so this one is about me as an individual so i'm um i mean if you've not realized i'm black if you, if you saw my picture at the beginning and didn't realize I was black I can't really help you guys uh, but I'm a I I see myself as a black British woman um, my parents both migrated from Jamaica when they were very young um, I'm mum to two children who are both autistic and were both diagnosed in in as children I am a massive Marvel Cinematic Universe fan and I always in these talks always explain that if I could choose any profession it would be something Marvel related it would be writing about Marvel it would be analyzing Marvel I just love it I watch all the movies when when I'm not coping with life or I need to clean up I will have a Marvel movie on in the background so I am like hardcore so for me when when Disney plus came along especially during lockdown I felt just so spoiled and so privileged to have all the movies there in chronological order in order of every order you could think of I've watched them in and I absolutely um love it and even talking about it now my face is lit up and I'm really happy because I'm talking about something I really want to talk to you about I'm a compulsive overeater and I attend something called Overeaters Anonymous and so for me as a, a child I could not cope with life I didn't know I was autistic and I masked really well and so when you mask really well it has a knock-on effect and I, I found something to soothe me. And for me, unfortunately, it was food. And so I can eat volumes of food. And I it's almost like how an alcoholic would drink to self-soothe and to numb out from stress. That's what I also do. So for me, food is like one of my stims and it's, it's not a good stim. I wish I could change it. Um, but I have to accept it's who I am. So whether I'm happy or sad or anxious or confused, for me, the first thing I think of and go to to soothe me is food. Um, I was diagnosed with severe prolonged depression at 18. Uh, now for, for autistic girls, they often can mask until they're in secondary school. So when they're going through things like their GCSEs or their A-levels, when a lot more pressure is placed on you and you're expected to deliver, that's when a, a, a person who's masking, that's when it gets really difficult. So that time was really hard for me at 18. And um, I was put on antidepressants and I've been on antidepressants on and off ever since. I at 19 had raindrop psoriasis and they thought it was meningitis because I couldn't cope in the working environment I was in there was I, it was at Meadow Hall and it was indoors and it was really loud and there was fluorescent lighting and customers asking me a million things all the time and I had to smile and pretend I could cope and I couldn't and so having to pretend for eight hours a day it's going to have an effect on your your body and your health um, I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue and so when they talk about 
masking is exhausting. I am exhausted all the time and I have a lot of um, neurological pain because of working in the environments that I've worked in up until the age of 36 when I realised and received a diagnosis for autism and that's when I started to make like changes in my life and I ended up at first getting a a, a 10 hour job a week which was like a children and family worker that went into schools and like gave assemblies so that was quieter and then I went back to university to kind of understand me better so I went to do a master's in autism um, at Sheffield Hallam and I um, I wanted to be able to support my children better so you know you can see I've come on here and I'm doing this presentation and I think the presentation's going well I think I appear to lead you all to believe that I can cope with stuff in the way that I talk and and in how the presentation's flowing but then we get to this page and this is my daily struggles and this is this is this page is here to show you and to explain to you about masking and camouflaging so and had I got a diagnosis of Asperger's and then I'm in this this job people feel oh well Melissa's living her best life and, and she understands what the hell she's doing and I, I don't on any given day I'm overwhelmed with a lot of things and there's a lot of support that goes into me kind of functioning and that's medical support that's psychological support and also support at work so I I'm supported in I'm supported in a lot of my life but I'm also a very independent person as well and a mother and a wife and a homeowner so there's 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 so many different sides to me as a person but I mask it really really well no that's wrong so this is my working life now so I'm going to put my professional hat back on and appear to know what I'm talking about appear to be like in charge and a go-getter but I hope now that you understand that I am masking so I am struggling with everything all the time so I am the Adult Autism Coordinator for Voluntary Action Sheffield and I'm also the coordinator for the Sheffield Autism Partnership Network and that's called SAPAN. So as part of my role, um, I work closely with the Sheffield Autism, um, sorry, yeah, as part of my role, I'm working with the Sheffield Autism Partnership Board because um, I've put board there and it should be the word network so I'm the network coordinator but there's a board that sits above us and and that is manned and chaired by the Sheffield City Council and so we work very closely with them to ensure that the service services are right for autistic people in Sheffield because that's really really a big passion of mine um, I do it for selfish reasons because I want to ensure that everyone my children comes into contact with understands autism and I want to ensure that my children when they become adults can lead happy healthy lives and the word happy and healthy means different things to different people but I want my children to feel a part of Sheffield and not feel or be secluded because of lack of understanding and support for autistic people in this city. Um, and so last year, on the day that we launched the Sheffield Autism Partnership Network, the central government also launched the, um, the National Autism Strategy. So we've been waiting for that for a while. The last one came out just over 10 years before. It was supposed to come out before lockdown, but obviously everything went on hold. And then um, we, we changed health secretaries <laughs> mid lockdown. So then that, so it got pushed back again. So it came out in July last year. And so we're trying to support the voluntary community and faith sector that work, to work with us collaboratively so to, to support the Sheffield autistic communities. 
We're trying to ensure that the public statutory sector are proactively working with autistic people and that we that we also work proactively with autistic people and their support systems. And by support systems, we mean parents, carers, friends, partners, etc. Um, we're trying to, in, and like I said before, ensure that everyone my children and I come into contact with has an understanding of um, autism and a fitting understanding for the area of work that they're in. So I want the hairdressers to understand it. I want the local police officer. I want the person who sweeps the roads. I want the, the caretaker in school. I, I want everybody and anybody to understand autism. And so I am the coordinator for SAPAN and that's kind of a lot of what I, I do. And I, I was you know, happy to come and talk in this session. And it's just to say that the Sheffield Women in Technology are now part of our network. And I'll talk to people about how the people you work with in your organization can become part of the network as well. So the strategy is in Crank, and some people may really love and enjoy reading the central strategy. I, I didn't. Um, and so I thought it was important to pull out the key things that you as an audience need to know. And so they have created six priority areas. And part of this strategy, the strategy as a whole, has to now be incorporated into all the cities within the UK. So we are working closely with uh, Sheffield to ensure that they make a fantastic autism strategy for Sheffield to serve the, Sh the Sheffield community. And so these are the priority areas. So priority area one is improving understanding and acceptance of autism within society. Priority area two is improving autistic children and young people's access to education and supporting positive transitions into adulthood. Priority area three is supporting more autistic people into employment. Priority area four is tackling health and care inequalities for autistic people. Priority area five is building the right support in the community and supporting people in, in inpatient care. And then you have priority six, which is improving support within the criminal and youth justice systems. And so what's different about this strategy to the one that came out 10 years ago, the one that came out 10 years ago was just for adults. Thankfully, this one looks at uh, it's, it's an all age approach. And, and so we're now looking at children and young people. So within my post, I don't look at children. I was appointed as the adult autism coordinator, but there is crossover and, for, and young people, that's, that's 40, something like 14 to 25. So I do work in that sector, but I don't work in the children's sector. So these are the priority areas. And this is, I, I work really closely with the priority areas to help the network members, so people who have joined our network, to help the network members see what priority areas they can support in the strategy going forward and to see what priority areas, you know, I help them to see what will be important to them and the people who they, the autistic people that they support within their organizations. So these are some, but not all of our network members. And when, when I first came into post, I think we envisaged that we would have a network of autism charities and groups. The more I became comfortable and confident in, in the job, because I was, very, I was very unconfident in what I was doing and I was really, um, I lost a lot of sleep over the post because I am naturally a nervous person who, you know, very rarely knows what the hell I'm doing. But as I became more confident in the post, I started to realise that actually there are lots of autistic people that don't go to charities, that don't go to autism based organisations. I also know that if an autistic person, whether they go to autism related charities or not, if they're reaching, if they're in crisis around somewhere, say, for instance, they may become homeless. 
they may not go to the autism charity about that they may go to a homeless charity and so for me it was important that we make network members any organization who will come into contact with autistic people and so then that opened I feel it opened the gateway for us to have more of a um, not just holistic but collaborative approach because I really vehemently believe in collaboration and so I want to ensure that anywhere that an autistic person may go whether it's for healthcare reasons for recreational reasons for psychological reasons that actually I want I want anywhere they go to to be a, a, a network member and as and being part of a network member it means you're committing to understanding autism better working collectively with the other people within that the network helping to feed into the autism strategy to make sure we are supporting autistic people in Sheffield so that's the end of my um presentation <laughs>